My name is David Cohen. I'm with Variety Content Studio. Before I moved over to the branch of content unit, I was Variety's de facto technology editor for about 10 years. Uh, so I thought when I was going to go do this that, oh, this is right in my sweet spot. And then I started looking into the project and discovered I'm not sure I can even entirely describe this. So I'm going to let our panel describe it more fully. Um, the Frankenstein AI is uh, an interactive artificial intelligence. I don't know about you, but it, when I go to restaurants and get into cars here, people say, are you here for Sundance? And I kind of go, well, sort of, because I don't have a badge for the festival, I'm not going to any of the screenings, but this is an actual Sundance presentation that we're going to be talking about. So this is our official connection to the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, let me introduce Lance Weiler. Lance is the director of the Columbia University Digital Storytelling Lab, and he's been at the cutting edge of entertainment and technology for over 20 years. Nick Childs is the CCO of Society. He helped create the E-Trade Baby campaign and has won multiple lines at Cannes. Uh, I suggest you look up their bios because they're way more interesting stuff than I have time to talk about. So first, I'm going to leave it up to you Give us a, sort of the lowdown on what the Frankenstein AI project is, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, well, it's the 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's text, uh, the original book, uh, written by an 18, 19 year old in 1818, and it seemed like a wonderful jumping off point for what we were doing with the piece. The piece is really, um, it's very outside the box. Like if I were to draw like a box, I'd have to go all the way over to the other side of the room and show you where the dot runs outside of it. Um, basically what's going on within it is we are collaborating with an artificial intelligence. We are co-writing and doing an adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, it is cued through a number of emotional states. So it's a generative project. It's shaped, it's called a monster by many because festival goers are actually adding to it and it's constantly changing and evolving. It's part of a design research project that we're doing at the university to look at how humanity can have a role in shaping emergent technologies. A lot of algorithms are shaped with transactional data. We're looking and saying, what if we used human data? What if that was actually part of the equation? So it's about memories, emotions, fears, and hopes. The way that it manifests itself is through uh, Projection mapping, uh, data visualization, uh, it makes use of the Internet of Things, and it makes use of AI. I, if you have a chance and you can check it out, uh, I highly recommend you cruise down to New Frontier. There's a lot of really wonderful members that work down there, um, and, uh, and you can see it will we'll get you in to see it. Maybe eight people go through it at a time, and, uh, and then we have a one-time performance on the 23rd where uh, an AI will give birth to a human form and that human form will work through choreography that's algorithmic. So, uh, I know that sounds out of this world, but you have to, you have to see it. And I have some footage on my phone if anybody wants to see it. Nick, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I try to catch up with Lance most of the time, and just like, be along for the ride. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Lance launched something called Pandemic at Sundance that really explored, um, I'll call it the Internet of Things and connectivity and uh, near field communication for the first time. Again, this was a few years ago, and I think it was way ahead of the curve. With this project in AI, Lance is much tighter to the curve that we're all talking about. If you guys were at CES last week, a couple weeks ago, um, if you read the Wall Street Journal yesterday, Time, everybody's talking about AI. And the filter we're in now with whether or not you're turning your phone black and white, so you're not quite as addicted to your phone anymore, everybody's talking about technology and how humans are better engaged and interacting with it. And this project, when Lance first mentioned it to me, I think way back in the summertime, I just became fascinated by in any way that I could help out or be part of it because what we're exploring, not only in, in, in my business life of marketing, but also my, my interest in art is going beyond what's next. And, and New Frontiers was set up years ago to really be the future of film. It was called that years ago because it was the future of film. Now it's become the future of storytelling. And that storytelling means VR, AR, AI. From my perspective right now, the closest we are with changing, fracturing traditional storytelling the way we know it is probably AI. Because VR, nobody really has headsets yet. AR is interactive in a very singular way. So I think AI is really where a lot of people are focused right now on what will it become? Will it be a good thing? Will it be a machine with a bad thing? That kind of cliche conversation. 
Um, but this project connects because the story of the Frankenstein monster um, being born, going into the wilderness, being disconnected from humanity, and turning into a bad thing is fascinating as a through line to what Lance has built downtown. And if you go see it or you hear about it afterwards, the visceral emotional connection you have going through seeing an AI come to life through the own story, your own story that you can put into the machine in real time, is, is just wrong. We promise we are going to bring this back to marketing. So just bear with us for a minute. But we're going to start, well, let's talk a little bit about the promise of AI. What do you feel like the promise of AI is for the creation of art? Let's start with that. And what do you think the limitations are? Let me start with uh, Lance. Um, I think what's really exciting about AI and is incredibly uh, challenging about AI is it's almost like you're working with a toddler that won't learn in certain respects. But um, it's incredible in terms of the ability, the, un, the ambiguity of what it the possibilities. In this project, and this does relate to marketing with people who are in this room, this project is hitting up at <clears throat> the idea of ownership and authorship of stories. And it's basically saying, who are those formerly known as the audience? And if they're creators now, what does that mean to the work that we make? And it's also looking and saying, okay, it's not about a replacement, it's not an end war. <clears throat> it's, it's more about this idea of it being a creative companion. You know, it's kind of like the project is about where machine intelligence and human creativity intersect. And so when I look at that and some of the, the ways in which the algorithm is drawing from the corpus of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, it's drawing from Reddit and things that it finds on the internet. It's drawing from these memories, emotions, fears, and hopes of the participants that go through it. When you come into it, it it's constantly different. When you walk in, the AI has a different emotional state every time. It's almost like it has a mental illness or something. It's totally bizarre. You come in and it's reflective of what's happened. And the way that people can see a trace, there's like these four principles that we use in the digital storytelling lab that I think would have a lot of, uh, they, they can be applied in many ways. They can be applied in marketing, they can be applied in, in, in a variety of contexts, and we use them all the time in all the projects that we work on. The first is an idea of trace. You know, people really respond when they can see some part of themselves in whatever the story is. The second is this idea of granting agency, moving from an individual activity to a group activity and back and forth again. The third is a thematic frame. Mary Shelley is a wonderful thematic frame, right? So there's a common language, a common grammar, so you can immediately start collaborating, right? The last is very interesting. It's serendipity management. A lot of digital work is overwrought with explanation. You know, I'm a screenwriter by trade, so it's like show, don't tell, right? Digital work is like overwrought with the concern that somebody's going to break it, the concern that they're not going to use it the right way. And the beauty lies in those blank spaces. So those four principles are at work within this piece. And similar to other pieces that we've done, that we've done at the lab, it's about like this whole new wave of, um, you know, kind of working and realizing, like for instance, my son is nine years old. Um, he makes Let's Play videos. He has a YouTube channel. He came out for the first couple days of the festival and he was, he's, he's working on the platformer right now, like designing the levels of the games. He's nine and him and his friends do this. That's their activity. So I look at that and I think, wow, you know, he is one of the things he's creating things that he's nine years old. So what does that mean? Like, what's that next generation that's coming? And how does it work? And I think about technology in the same way. The technology should serve the story all the time. And that's what we work to do. And, and, and I think for the, the, the group here, when you're trying to figure out or you're trying to vet a technology that you want to make use of, the way that we do it is we always start with the human experience first. Because the technology has a way of getting in the way of that human emotional part. And just because there's something that's trending or it feels like it's something that everybody's going towards, um, we'll, we'll always kind of prototype it and start with paper, analog, work it out, and we'll find that human emotional core. And that makes the work transcend scale. Nick, from your point of view, working on the agency side, where what do you see as the potential and the limits of AI? I want to just quickly start by saying that when Dylan took a picture of that Lance took, that's his son interacting with the AI. And to me, that's exactly what you're talking about. Is how do we get the Dylans or understand that the Dylans of the world are going to be able to engage with these things and not overthink that technology is impossible. It takes a lot of incredible work behind the scenes, but I love what you just said about overthinking digital. If we can create an experience that people can engage with, this is Dylan talking with the AI and Dylan. Like, that's just, he's just going to walk in and be able to do it, and that's the world that he's into. We have to make that bulletproof for our clients. We have to show them that we can be out on the bleeding edge. It's very comfortable for us to be 
selling things in, let's just call it what it is, in, in, uh, in conversational interfaces right now, for us at the agency, that's chatbots. That's chatbots that are basically giving you, hopefully, a good experience with the brand, but it's just a slight interaction. This is conversational interfaces at the next level. But the question is, how can I take this and make it palatable and have ROI and all of those measurements in place for clients so that we can get to doing what's next? Um, for me, the original question that you asked is fascinating because I was lucky to be a part of a Canon project that was the first collaborative film shot on the DSLR at a very high level years ago here. And we launched it with Canon not to talk about the film, but to talk about the future of filmmaking. And even the guys at my agency, the creators with me would say, this is amazing, we have a great new camera. This means that any director of photography can be a director. Like, that's not what that means. This is a new tool, right? You're not wrong necessarily, but these things are, are tools to me. So AI and the pieces, I, I don't find the threat being a writer, being a screenwriter, pompously hoping that I could be a storyteller. Um, I don't find AI and technology to be a threat because I'm looking at it like any other tool that might enable us to power the story better. But this Frankenstein Stein AI, for example, that's not the AI doing this. That's Lance and the team and everybody coming together and figuring out what story they want to tell and then making the story come to life with any tool at their disposal. <coughs> So, if I'm understanding this correctly, that this AI is responding to uh, teaching, input, whatever you want to call it, both from the team that has built the, built the uh, piece, but also from the audience. So, it's in, what went to my head is it, it takes a village to make a monster. I mean, is that, is that really what's going on here? And to some degree, that the, the AI itself is the work of art that you are creating here? Well, I think it's very much like it's like holding a mirror up to humanity, you know, like algorithms connect us and they isolate us all the time. Those are two core themes that are found within the book. And in fact, Frankenstein's a monster. All the character is trying to do is connect. And at every turn, it is isolated, you know, and it becomes this, um, almost like this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy of what a monster is. So if you think about algorithms and you think about the challenge that we face with them, the big element that we're looking at in it is we're saying, well, if we can get a bunch of humans together, and, and what's been interesting in regards to the project is people go through it and they're amazed how connected they are to another human being and that, that an AI was facilitating, you know, that they were collaborating with an AI around that. And so I think, I think in that sense, what's exciting about the potential of it is this idea that uh, there are all these new stories that we have not seen before. And now it's not about necessarily a story about a, a beginning, middle, and end. These are ongoing. The fact that it's generative, the fact that if you came 30 minutes later, it's totally different. And it's totally different. And it's customized. And when you walk in, it, it greets everybody who walks into the room by name. You know, so like they go through the experience and they come in and it's visualizing itself and it's kind of otherworldly. And then it's saying David, saying Nick, saying Lance. I'm confused. Why do humans treat each other this? You know, it, surf, it scrapes the internet, and that's how it, it shapes. Is this that. is this something that's scalable? That could potentially be online, have millions of people experience it simultaneously. <coughs> yeah, it's built on a you know a neural network model. You know, it is, it's transacting millions and millions. It, it's crazy. Yes, it's, the scale is not a problem. So and so, for example. A next step could be something as simple as why do human beings treat them, treat each other the way they do? And wouldn't they be better if they went to McDonald's? Uh, I, I'm not sure about that question, but uh, I, but I do think that um, what we're trying to do with the piece is we're looking at it and we're saying what could a human corpus look like? You know, and, 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 and a corpus is what fuels an AI, and and if we can have those human elements or humanity. I think to your question about McDonald's, whether or not Trump would want us all to go to McDonald's and be better people. Um, for me, it's not about that question, and that's what interests me and kind of I get fired up about is what if you're a brand coming to something like this, what is your story and what should you be doing? So to me, uh, I don't know how Lance feels, but this is a very specific iteration and uh, project for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. For what that was exploring 200 years ago, and we've constantly been exploring, investing with technology ever since then. If we 
try to, in this case, extend life, are we challenging the guy? Right? That's, we're still dealing with that question in technology and AI. So for me, if a brand came to me or to Lance in a collaboration and said, what can we do with this? We would probably come up with something completely different built from what that, that brand could own or wants to own at its core, if that makes sense. <coughs> Nick, tell us about going from something that is strictly the creation of a work of art here and turning that into success in marketing. What carries over to trying to tell a brand message to potential consumers? Um, for me, I think the challenge is to try and not see delineation between these things. If we're talking about branded content, if we have a brand years ago come to us and say, I, I want to make a documentary film. I think any of those things can live in both worlds, and everything we aspire to should be art. Uh, I think you have to be careful to not be making art for art's sake and understand the strategy behind what you're doing. Uh, I go back to what I was just saying, though. The core essence for me is, are we telling the right story for what uh, a marketing platform, a brand, um, is, is truly behind. Um, I just met somebody from REI. REI, with the opt-out side, that opt-out plan, that to me is so brilliant because it comes from the core of who REI is and decides they want to be. The content, the marketing that falls out of that, now can stretch across all sort of connected points. That's what intrigues me now. It could be film, it could be digital, it could be AI, it could be a lot of different things, definitely experiential, but it all has to tie back an honest and authentic core message. We have just under four minutes left, and I know that this is a sort of an out there presentation for this conference. So I want to get a show of hands to see if there are people who have questions. Because if you do, I want to give you a chance to ask what you might ask, what I might ask are different. Okay. Anybody? Back in the back. Where, where is it? Uh, down in the festival? Can we, can we go today? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's at New Frontier, um, uh, which is at the Kimball Art Center. Uh, and it's for people at a time, and then the performance on the 23rd is for about 100 people. As you guys know where that is, it's down, it's not on Main Street, it's closer to the Marriott headquarters, down in that area. Prospector. Yeah, Prospector. Here? What does it actually look like? you should ask. Yeah. So you yeah. Have you can share. I, I have some stuff on my phone that I can show oh. you. But um, it almost, it's kind of otherworldly. It's like, uh, it's almost like if you've ever seen the movie Arrival, you know, when they go and they start to encounter, it, it's, it has quality to that. You know, it takes on various forms. So yeah, it, you describe it, we don't get to see your phone. Sure. Just, you, you can share that on Twitter, right? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be posting all kinds okay. of stuff on the hashtag Frankenstein, Frankenstein AI. But I think one of the key elements was to allow people to see all kinds of things. And, you know, it's almost like when you look at clouds, I can see something, you can see something. There's a big four foot by five foot tank um, that is powered, I describe this terribly, but um, driven by a uh, back projector, rear projected light. It's the AI coming to life there, and you see it through smoke. So it kind of it, it, it changes all the time, and it's morphing, um, and it's it's just I would say more artistic, um, but also powered by sonic. Yeah, things be around it. And then we have these IoT instruments, like these drums that have electromagnetic heads underneath the surface of so the drums, illuminate, and the voice of the AI comes through the drum and can feel it vibrate. But I think the thing that's really interesting about this and the team that we've worked with is we've stretched each other, so the work well in the way that we're challenging each other from having like an algorithm designer on the team to a machine learning engineer. <clears throat> Those things are applicable and can be used not just in this project but across any other work where people are trying to figure out how to even wrestle with artificial intelligence. And, and I just haven't looked at the thing on Lance's phone. It's not a representational image of a human body. It's much more abstract and sort of fluid. But it does become human at times. That's interesting. And yet, we've got a minute and a half left here. Uh, yeah, quick question. Um, as you're discussing and talking about it, exploring human emotions, throughout all the inputs that you guys have been coming, has it developed its own emotional state beyond anything that's quantified from a human emotional state? Uh, not yet. You know, it's in the early phases. But um, but what it's doing is really wild. And what's interesting about artificial intelligence is it fails in ways that are very difficult for humans to comprehend. 
and succeeds in ways that are very difficult for humans to comprehend. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a really fascinating collaborator. And I think, uh, you know, just in closing, I think what's powerful about it is, at the end of the day, it's storytelling. You know, what we're doing is we're telling stories. And we're looking at this whole new wave of uh, ubiquitous and pervasive technology and saying, okay, how can we actually tell stories? But these aren't stories that are necessarily owned by any one person. These are stories that change, ebb, and flow based upon those emotional inputs. So we'll see where it ends up in terms. Come back to me in like a year and I'll let you know. It's a multi-year multi project, so. Yeah, actually just quickly on that, um, Lance's plan is to take this to the, the National Theater in London and then even the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh and then cycle back and, and hopefully have it in the fall back at Columbia for a multi-night engagement. Uh, but it will morph over time. It won't be the same thing it is now in London. It won't be the same thing in London as in Scotland and Scotland as in New York because as the machine learns, I think, we're learning, too, the best way to express what's next in this story. So it's just really cool. It's not a three-act structure. It's immersive and growing and it just continues. So if you're interested in an AI for good project, okay. because there's a lot of dystopian views around artificial intelligence, you should talk to us. <laughs> We're over time, but I'm going to take a few seconds here. Yesterday, I, uh, for a branded content piece that Variety is doing, uh, interviewed Sherry Filo, who's the head of the New Frontier uh, piece of Sundance. And we were talking about storytelling, and, and I said, what's the importance of storytelling? And she said, well, storytelling is how we make sense of the world. Oh, a computer in your hand is just a piece of metal about storytelling. And if you frame things in that way, the com in order to make sense of the world, there is a narrative that is being formed. It's an internal narrative that, uh, to simply explain what is happening around. If the AI is doing that, then it is actively storytelling internally all the time. <laughs> there is an area of storytelling at a very deep level that we don't think about, but it's very powerful. With that, I am over time, so we will wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for sitting here.